Amen. Come on in. Let's go ahead as they're finishing that out. Uh, we'll go ahead and have a word of prayer, and we'll jump right into our song portion of the service tonight. Let's pray. Brother Chris, would you mind lead us, uh, leading us in prayer this evening, my friend? Yeah. Amen. All right, let's remain seated. And actually, let's let's exercise. Let's stand. And uh, song number 395, In My Heart There Rings a Melody. Let's lift our voice together. Brother Wright, come lead us in it. 395. I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. There's a melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody of love. On that last verse three, will be my endless theme in glory. With the angels I will sing will be a song with glorious harmony When the chords of heaven ring In my heart there rings a melody There rings a melody with heaven's harmony In my heart there rings a melody melody of love. Good. You may be seated. Turn to page 174, 174. Faith is the victory. I'm 174. Encamped along the hills of light, the Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing sky. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On that last. To him that overcomes the foe, white raven shall be given. Before the angel he shall know his name confessed in death. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the host of night in Jesus' conquering name. That overcomes the world. Amen. All right, let's just be honest. How many of you eight seconds at lunch? All right, that's what I'm, okay, like <laughs> two of us. All right, all right, praise the Lord. What a blessing. And uh, brother, uh, uh, what's your name? Brother Reese, he said he brought his steel-toed shoes tonight for the service. And uh, man, what a blessing this morning was. And uh, I'm so excited about some things that, uh, you know, God's working on my heart about. And I hope he's working on your heart about it. And uh, I'm really looking forward to next week as well. And uh, Brother Jay Nepomuceno is going to be a huge blessing. And uh, he, is, he has preached in many different places across this state and across this country on the topic. And I was speaking with a member uh, of our church a while ago about the topics of depression and mental health and things of that nature. And, and I don't know, Brother uh, Chris, at some point, uh, Baptist pastors somehow I uh, had the idea that we know everything about everything and uh, that somehow we became psychologists and we became this and we became that. 
And uh, I'm thankful that there are people who have experience dealing with those things. And, and I'm, I, I want to say I'm not too proud to bring an expert in and to try to help our people because, as Brother Chadwick said this morning, we want the holistic view of our Christianity. And this is something that uh, I think I'm going to be greatly blessed by next week as well. So come back next week. And uh, Brother Jay, and obviously you're here tonight for Brother Chris Chadwick. And it's been a blessing. We are excited to have our newest couple uh, with us. Would you stand and give them a round of applause as they kiss? Come on, bro. <laughs> then Miss Esther will, will be joining the church at the end of the service, and so we're excited to have her and uh, excited to have him now with his wife and uh, looking forward to the days ahead. One of the things that's coming up is our quarantine youth rally, and uh, we are very excited about all the different things that God is working out, and we'll have a bunch of planning going on this week uh, about different activities, and so if you'd like to help us with that, uh, we'll start probably talking about that on Wednesday night, getting sign-up sheets for you know food preparation and set up and breakdown and coat, you know referee and all these different things. Uh, places. And so we want to be a blessing, yes, to our kids as well, uh, but also to the other churches. And so uh, church family, be ready for that. We'll have some special offerings. And this is not a an, in, uh, an inexpensive thing, but it's an investment in our next generation. And every dollar put in is going to be worth the investment. And so please uh, be prepared for that if you would. And then also along the lines of money, our offering at the end of the service, anything that comes in loose or undesignated or designated for Brother Chadwick, um, just put that in your memo. All of that, all that comes in in our boxes and then also in our evening service service uh, online. If you'll designate that love offering, if you follow the link through, uh, and maybe you came tonight and you don't have the cash or the checkbook, you can also go online via your phone and you can give just designated love offering. And if you're making out a check to drop in there, make it out to the church, but put in the memo uh, love offering. We'll make sure that he gets all of that tonight. And so please be uh, generous on your way out tonight. Our giving boxes are both directions. And uh, thank you for being faithful to your tithes, your offerings, and your missions. And now let's be generous to the man of God as he has been a great blessing to us. And so uh, let's do this uh we do have do we have an anniversary this week brother chad no is it next week after the after sunday it's sunday i believe okay all right we'll get to you next sunday i'm trying to help you out there anybody else have an anniversary this week any birthdays this week all right we're saving all the time for you brother brother chadwick okay fantastic well let's sing then and uh, it's song 327 springs of living water lift your voice tonight this will be our last opportunity to praise the lord in song and uh, so let's lift our voice and then we'll get the preacher right up after this Three, two, seven. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound. Drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul they satisfy, drinking at the springs of living water. Oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Verse 2. How sweet the living water from the hills of God. It makes me glad and happy all the way. Now glory, grace, and blessing mark the path I I'm shouting hallelujah every day, drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul is satisfied, drinking at the springs of living water. Oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. On that last Oh, sinner, won't you come today to Calvary? A fountain there is flowing deep and wide. The Savior now invites you to the water free, where thirsting spirits can be satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I.
I hope you're ready. Open your Bible, and uh, Brother Chris Jaggers is going to come. And one of the things I appreciate the most about him, obviously, is the use of Scripture, but also his spirit as he presents these truths. And uh, so let's get our hearts ready, and let's listen. Brother Chris, thank you again for making the effort to come down. And uh, I know you took time away from your church and your pulpit in the COVID season, and uh, so that is not lost on me. I appreciate your sacrifice to come for others. Appreciate it. Well, our church is happy that I'm gone, so they consider it a blessing that uh, you invited me. Uh, I am pumped to be here and thankful. Thankful for your pastor. I mean, this isn't just like pastors speak like I have to. I really just like people who like Jesus. And I don't know if that makes sense to you, but sometimes I'm around pastors and they seem like they don't like Jesus. And it's like, dude, it shouldn't be that hard in life to, to smile and be happy and I've enjoyed it. We had some great barbecue last night. What was the name of that place? Salties? That was legit. I mean, I'm from Texas, and I would go back there. Uh, most barbecue in California I wouldn't go back to. I mean, I'd eat it if somebody else bought it, but I'd actually pay for that. That was, that was great stuff, and I loved it. And, and the food today and the fellowship at the Oars. I don't know where the Oars are. I just know the kids are here. Are your parents here? They just drop you off. Free babysitting at church. Oh, there you are in the back. I've known Brother Bobby for 27 years. Um, and when 27 years ago, Karen was seven. So I've known her that long, too. And he's always sat in the back of the church. Bob, I don't know what the deal is. I don't know. Did he do that as a teenager? Always in the back? He did. All right, you guys, I'm going to pray for Bobby that he'll sit up front from now on with the rest of his family. He's being led by his children. And so I'm kidding. I don't even know if he's laughing. He might be out there loading a gun. So if I die tonight, you'll know who did it. Uh, But I appreciate so much the, the spirit here, the faithfulness, and just appreciate you and and especially after a message like I preached this morning, you came back. And you know kind of where I'm going tonight, and you came back. I'm just telling you, I'm pumped about that. Like, uh, that, that's pretty awesome. Not every place would that happen. And I appreciate your pastor wanting you to uh, have a full understanding of God's expectation and God's grace in our life. God's expectations are always accompanied by the grace of God. We can't ever live the Christian life in our own strength. And I think that's something that is desperately important to remember as we talk about some harder topics. And it doesn't matter what the topic is. You can't have a good marriage without the grace of God. And somebody say amen there. Okay, we'll preach on marriage then if nobody says amen. You can't have a good marriage apart from the grace of God. Now, we need to understand what grace is. Grace is the supernatural enabling of God that brings about Christ-like change. Grace always brings about Christ-like change. Somebody said, well, I thought grace was everything for nothing or God's riches at Christ's expense. That's called salvific grace. But once you're saved, then you have sanctifying grace. And sanctifying grace always produces Christ-likeness in our life. It is never to make our life easy, fun, frivolic. It is always to make us more like Christ. That's why we are still here. And I rejoice in a pastor that understands that. Here, you ought to rejoice in that because it's a rarity and that you understand that the greatest joy of the Christian life is that it is Christ in you, the hope of glory that is bringing about the change. And so I'm pumped about that. It's great to see Hunter. I never met Hunter before. I don't even like him. I shook his hand. I just decided I don't like him. I've known Esther since she was in the third or fourth grade. Our kids, my daughters went to school with Esther. I watched her play volleyball. And then she marries a loser with a beard. I'm just not happy about this. I say loser because I'm 47 and I can't grow a beard. So I hate guys that are, what, 19 years old with a beard on. I mean, how old are you? 18. See, that's my point. No, I'm totally kidding. Congratulations. I'm pumped. You married a great young lady. Uh, My family loves the Cabal family. They're part of a great church. My friend Carlos Serrano is the pastor there. And Brother Obero did a great job. And Esther, just pumped that you married a man who loves Jesus and that you get to be here. I'm sad that you're in Bakersfield. (sighs) I I love Bakersfield, but have you been outside? Holy cow, like the Lumbia cooks itself here. I mean, it is killer hot. A guy in our church texted me. He said, Pastor, it was so hot today. And he sent me a picture, 87 degrees in San Diego. And then then he texted me back, and it's over 100 in Bakersfield. I sent him a text as we were leaving, 530 at night. My car's in the shade, my in-law's house, 109 degrees. And I just thought, oh, I'm not going to church. So, no, it's awesome. Awesome to be here. First Timothy chapter 4, verse number 8. First Timothy chapter 4, verse number 8. 
as we broach this subject, there will be a part of me that is a little bit nervous, and I'm probably a little bit more nervous than if I were preaching it at my own church, and let me tell you why. I don't have a problem defending my position. I feel a little bit nervous leaving a friend of mine to defend my position. And so if you have questions, understand, I, I might get pretty passionate about it. It's just my nature. Um, I'm passionate about the dog food that we use. Uh, I'm passionate about my favorite football team, and I don't even have one. Just tell me which one to go for, and I'll be passionate about it. I'm just a, a relatively passionate person. I want you to know that my passion is not intended to be in any way um, aggressive, if that's the right word, or demonstrative. I, I'm just a, a person that is passionate about just about everything that he does. Like, I could explain to you, you know, a lot of things, and it would all come across as super passionate. And so if you have questions, please see me after the service. I would love to answer them. The subject that we have tonight is, is very near and dear to my heart, and I don't want to, um, again, I don't want to be abusive with the Scripture or with a struggle that a person might have. Um, so this evening, I'm going to ask you to really consider deeply the truth of the Word of God and consider deeply just some of the thoughts that I will convey. And I told your pastor, I am, I am known for, and I have the privilege every once in a while preaching in other places and always humbled by that, but I'm known for being a, an intensely expositional preacher. I preached through the book of Matthew. It took me nine years through the book of Matthew, over 300 messages to go paragraph by paragraph by paragraph Never getting boring, always getting more exciting, and building to the res or to the to the ascension of Christ back to heaven and the Great Commission. I mean, it's just an awesome study. Uh, two years in John's epistles. I mean, I just I'm a verse by verse kind of guy. That's how I am. But on a subject like this, it's it's really difficult to do that because you want to get a a broad view, like a thirty thousand foot view of the Scripture to help us understand. We can get a street-level view at another time, but we want to get a broad view, and so that's why we will take it from this perspective. If you have 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 8 in your Scripture, Paul is obviously writing Timothy, uh, his son in the faith, uh, and he says in verse number 1, Now the Spirit speaketh especially that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And here's what they're doing. Here's what they're doing. Now, this is not an all-inclusive list that's going to happen in the latter times, but here's some of the things that are listed. Forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats. Like, hey, don't eat meat. Do we hear that in our culture today? I mean, come on. Do we not hear that in our culture today? Like, oh, I wouldn't eat meat. Let me tell you, I just wouldn't eat meat. We hear it preached. We hear it taught. No, they're, they're, they're departing. The body says meat for the belly and the belly for meat. God has provided both it and them. And uh, he provided the belly and the stuff to put in the belly. You say, well, what's he put in the belly? Meat. Meat's healthy for you. Meat's a good thing. The redder, the better. No, it's true. I can prove it, too. I don't still want to tonight, but uh, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving for them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good. He's talking about meats. And it is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. I, I'll never forget our church. Uh, has quite a few Fili or has had quite a few Filipino people in it over the years. And one time I was smart enough, and I said, "There's." I was preaching on this text. There's no meat that I don't think a Christian shouldn't eat. And a Filipino brother named Danny walked up to me after the service. He said, "Pastor, we have a fellowship next week. Would you eat balut?" And I thought he was just messing around. I'm like, "Oh, sure." And if you don't know what balut is, it's a Filipino delicacy that Esther doesn't like. Am I right? It's, it's, yeah. And it's a half developed egg in the chicken. And so he said, Pastor, if I bring that, will you eat it? And I was just stupid, uh, thinking he wouldn't do it. And I was like, sure, I would. I'm, I'm a man. I'll eat it. So the next week, he brought it. You say, what'd you do? I ate it. You say, how did it taste? Like breakfast, eggs and chicken. It was great. All in one. I mean, it was fine. He was, And they made me an honorary Filipino after that. And so uh, uh, every creature of God is used. Nothing to be received, uh, refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. 
If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, Paul talking to Timothy. Timothy is the pastor of the church at Ephesus, a very mystical, a very idolatrous city. And Paul says to him, put the brethren in, put the saved folks in remembrance of these things. Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the word of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. So Paul is saying, hey, Timothy, here's some very, very practical things I want you to teach the church at Ephesus. I want you to teach the believers in Ephesus. It's not enough. Some people say, I think a church should just teach doctrine. A church is not a church if they don't teach biblical doctrine. But there are also some things in the scripture that Paul has taught us to teach. And then he says, refuse, verse number seven, profane basically stupid, ridiculous, worthless, just the idea, and old wives' fables, like like cleanliness is next to godliness. Well, there's probably some truth in that statement, but that's not a biblical idea. It's just so refuse to teach that and exercise yourself rather unto godliness. Focus on godliness. Live a godly life. The greatest gift we will give our community is a godly life. Your neighbors need you to live a godly life. Your children need you to live and have a godly marriage. Your parents need you to be godly children. Exercise, work yourself, invest yourself, invest your time, energy, talents, efforts into godliness or unto godliness. Live a godly life is what he's saying. And Timothy, as a pastor... You have that requirement. And then he says this, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Now, this has, we we heard today that if you're a Baptist or a fundamental pastor, statistically, and you are 70, there's a 76% likelihood that you will be fat or obese by the statistics that we looked at this morning and saw that have been researched and done with over and over and over again. We saw that, right? We saw that. I don't want to re-preach this morning's message. If you don't say amen, I'm going to re-preach this morning's message and tonight. So just say amen. It'll work, especially when I do this. Then you say amen and we'll all eat cake quicker. All right, there you go. So... We, we saw that the average fundamental Christian, which we are, the average fundamental Christian has a 30% greater chance of being obese than, than anyone else. The, the more fundamental you are in your faith, statistically speaking, the fatter you are. Remember, it's called fat in the church. How many of you remember what I'm talking about? Can I get amen, right? We, we heard that. We heard that. I would submit to you this evening. I would submit to you this evening that gluttony and sedentary lifestyle and indulgences of food are anything other, on a regular basis, are anything other than godly. I would submit to you today that most of the food eating that we do, and this is not intended to be negative, know my heart, is out of boredom, or in looking for comfort. We said a little bit this morning, we we feel sad, let's down a thing of Pringles. We feel happy, let's have apple fritters. We we miss somebody, let's have carrot cake because they had carrots in their garden, or whatever the case may be. There are a thousand reasons, and it's normally born out of a replacement of God being the source of our comfort and our rest. And so Paul is writing here, and he is writing to the young preacher, Timothy, and he says a phrase that has often been misapplied and abused, bodily exercise profits little. Let me tell you what that means. The the word little is the Greek word pros, P-R-O-S, and it just means for a short period of time. For a short period of time. Now, in order to understand the context of that, we need to read the verse. But godliness is profitable unto all things. Okay, godliness is profitable in every area of life. We, can we get an amen? That's, that's helpful, right? In every area. 
Godliness is profitable in all things, having promise of the life that now is here on this earth, right? I mean, that's what, and now is. We, we, we don't need a commentary to figure that out. And of that which is to come, or we can say it this way, of the life that now is and the life that is to come. Godliness is profitable today and godliness is profitable in eternity. How many would agree that that's what the scriptures say? Okay. But exercise, well, that profits a little. No, all he's saying is, is that exercise only profits on this earth. There's, there's no eternal profit to exercise. It, it's not like if you can do a thousand push-ups on the earth, you get to heaven and there's a special push-up crown. I'm like, oh, Jesus is impressed with that. No, no, no. God's not impressed with the strength of man. He gives man his strength. God's not impressed with that. It's, it, uh, he, he's not impressed with that at all. I mean, come on. The creator of the universe that spoke the world into existence is, is just keyed up because you can bench press your body weight. He doesn't care. But he doesn't say it's without any profit. He just simply limits the timetable of the profit to this day and age. Let's not forget that our bodies are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 19. What know you not that your body is the temple of, God, of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, somebody might say, well, Pastor, I... I've seen those guys on TV and they get big muscles and they just run around flexing all over the place. And they're just glorifying their body. And, and, and can I tell you that that's wrong? Can I tell you I take a strong stand against that and so does the Lord and so does the, obviously the Scripture does. They're bringing glory to themselves. That, that there's just a, a big, big problem with that. But I would argue that people who never deny themselves anything that they desire are also in some ways gratifying the flesh at every turn because they're giving themselves whatever it is they want. I'm thirsty. Let me have this. I'm hungry. Let me eat this. They never push away from the table till they have overeaten and over and over and over again. So simply because uh, exercising to the point of self-worship is bad, so too is eating to the point of continual self-gratification and obesity. And on either side, our body is the temple of God and should be viewed as the temple of God. So my prayer is tonight that we understand the need for the topic and that we will be changed. In Proverbs chapter 9, verse number 9 says, in verse number 8 says, Rebuke not a scorner lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. So I want to make a couple of statements here. I'm going to be dealing with this concept of exercise and and things like that. I want to say this. Number one, skinny doesn't equal healthy. Skinny doesn't equal healthy. Number two, the issue is stewardship and not size. Heavy doesn't always mean unhealthy. Skinny doesn't always mean healthy, and heavy doesn't always mean unhealthy. And let me say this. Don't worry about where you are in your fitness, if we want to use that term. Worry about where you're going. Don't worry about where you're at. Worry about where you're going. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. All men. The question is often asked of me, Pastor, what is the biggest contributor to bad health? Is it our diet or is it our sedentary lifestyle? I would submit to you that it's both. The majority of the issue is on diet. You could correct your diet all day long, but if you don't have some exercise, there's going to be a problem. You could exercise all day long, and if you don't control your diet, there is going to be a problem. In a recent article on this subject, the author started out with a striking statement. Sitting still will cause premature death. The risk is higher among those who sit still more than five hours a day. It is shown to be a risk, risk factor on its own, independent, listen to this, independent of hard exercise or BMI or body mass index. The more still, the higher risk of, of chronic disease. 
People that sit still more than four hours per day have a 40% higher risk than those who sit for fewer than four hours a day. A sedentary lifestyle and a lack of physical activity contribute to or raise the risk factors for anxiety. You're going to hear about that in a couple of weeks. Pastor's going to preach on it. Cardiovascular disease, mortality in elderly men by 30% and double the risk in, in elderly women. So if you're older and you're sedentary for four hours a day or more, it raises your risk of premature death by 30% and it doubles it for women. Deep vein thrombosis, depression, diabetes, colon cancer, high blood pressure, obesity, osteoporosis, lipid disorder, and kidney stones. According to the Health Daily News, inactivity is a major cause of death worldwide, with new research suggesting that a sedentary lifestyle is on par with both smoking and obesity when it comes to raising the risk for disease and mortality. So, so somebody who is skinny and sits around for four hours a day is at the same risk factor of somebody who smokes. And you say, well, but I, I don't smoke and I'm skinny. Yeah, but you sit around for eight hours a day. In four research papers published online a, in a special physically act, uh, activity-themed series in The Lancet, a number of investigating teams pegged the number of inactivity deaths, inactivity-related deaths at 5.3 million worldwide. 5.3 million people died because of inactivity. This figure attributed to a higher uh, an inactivity risk uh, related risk for major killers such as breast and colon cancer, type 2 diabetes, heart disease amounts to roughly one out of every 10 deaths globally, a tally more or less equivalent to the number of people who die as a result of smoking. One third of all adults globally, amounting to about 1.5 billion people, face a 20 to 30 percent greater risk of disease due to failing to engage in the kind of routine physical activity 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week typically recommended by public health officials. 43 percent of North Americans, that means us in Canada, our weak brothers to the north. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in Washington State. We had Canadians everywhere, and we always reminded them of that, uh, that we won. Uh, but 43% of North Americans are deemed to be inactive. Many of us sit in front of our computers no less than eight hours a day and then go home and sit on the couch or surf the Internet until the wee hours of the morning, and we start it all over again. Let's just be honest. We are a inactive, sedentary society. If we lived, I, I say this to our church all the time, if we lived during the time of Christ, to be super honest with you, I wouldn't preach on this because we would walk everywhere we go. We would walk everywhere if we lived on a farm. If I lived on a farm, I'd never work out. You say, why do you work out? Because I don't live on a farm. Why don't you live on a farm? Because you, you ever tried to buy a farm in San Diego? They're expensive. And there, and there aren't any. And, and we, we are a super inactive. We are the most inactive people that have ever lived on the face of the earth. We don't even garden anymore. Ask the average kid. And I'm not being critical of this, but ask the average kid, where do you get your food from the store? They're surprised when they realize it grows out of the ground. It's like the food grows in the store. You just walk in and whammo, hostess cupcakes everywhere to your heart's content. We are inactive as a general rule. We are inactive. In a recent study of 4,512 middle-aged Scottish men, and they studied these men for a little more than four years. This is so interesting. Don't get lost. Please stay with me. We'll bring this all to a conclusion here in just a minute or in several minutes. It found that those who said they spent two or more leisure hours a day sitting in front of a screen, either computer or TV or their phone, were double the risk of a heart attack or other cardiovascular events, negative events, compared with those who watched less. Those who spent four or more hours of recreational time in front of a screen were 50% more likely to die of any cause. It didn't, now listen to this, it didn't matter whether the men were physically active for several hours a week or not. 
exercise did not mitigate the risk associated with a high amount of sedentary screen time. So in other words, let me help you understand this. Here's what the study found. That you could work out for an hour and a half a day, three to four days a week, but if you sat in front of a TV or a computer for extended periods of time in the evening, or in the morning, didn't matter, but extended periods of time, that the exercise does not mitigate the sedentary nature of your life, does not overcome it, and you still face the negative consequences of a sedentary life. So in other words, simply going for a walk in the evening is not enough. Many Christians are dying prematurely or living in grave sickness simply because... We sit around all the time. I'm not a big proponent that everybody... Now, listen, I love to lift heavy weights, and I'll talk about that in a minute. The heavier, the better. I mean, I'm always in a state of minor injury because I'm lifting too many weights. Now, most of you would be like, I would never want to do that. I totally get that. There's something wrong with me. I understand. All right? I, I have... Every piece of massage equipment, basically, that you can buy. I have a, a guy on speed dial. His name's Jeffrey. Jeffrey, come here. I, can, I need you to come to my office and give me a massage. I can barely move today. I'm crawling, literally crawling up the stairs. There have been more than a few times that the staff of our church, we have to, they all have to work out, and, and most of the time we have to work out together, that we've, we've all literally just got done with a workout, come to the church, and our offices are upstairs and we look at those 18 stairs. There's 18 stairs that we have to walk up. And we're like, I don't think I can make it today. And you know what? We have to crawl up the stairs. Now, I'm not asking anybody to be as stupid as we are. For whatever reason, we just embrace our nonsense. And that's what we do. But I am saying that every single follower of Jesus Christ should be a physically fit person. I'm not worried. I don't think Jesus is worried about your size. I don't think Jesus is I don't think Jesus is worried about how much weight you can lift. Do I think you ought to lift weights? I think Jesus is worried about this. How are you stewarding the resource of the life and the body he has given you? Another study found that when overweight adults cut their TV time in half, they burned more calories than those who watched five or more hours a day. It's interesting that they found in many of these studies that simply playing board games or reading books burned way more calories than sitting around and watching TV. People that read books burn more calories than people that watch TV. You had no idea how many calories this does. The, the reality is people who read books are, are going to get up. They're going to move around more. They're going to think more deeply. They're going to engage more. There's something mind-numbing about our screen time. And then what we do is we get bored, we go get food, we come back, we sit down. How many of us have found ourselves just eating for no particular reason? We're just watching something and we're eating. Am I the only one that's ever done that? I've, I've, I've not been hungry and went and got food before. And when Debbie's home, because she has the gift of helps, and I have the gift of helping people exercise their spiritual gifts, <laughs> some of you will get that later. I'll say, hey, can, can I have some, some chips or something? And she'll go, oh, we don't have any in the house. And I'll be like, oh, that's a bummer. And she has the gift of help. She'll like, you want me to go to the store and get them? And we live close to stores, which is a bad idea. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. If you, I mean, if you want to, you don't have to or anything. And she'll go, I don't have to? Like, no, you don't. I mean, like, I'm not going to be mad or anything. I'll just be sad and sulk for two days. But that'll be fine. And so she'll go to the store and she'll bring home something, and I'll say, you know, get, a, you know, I want some Pringles, and she'll bring home Pringles and Doritos and, and Fritos, and then she'll bring home a, a whole fry cook guy just to cook us dinner. I mean, and, and I'm sitting down watching TV, and, and what could have been 30 minutes or an hour is now two or three hours of watching and eating and watching and eating and watching and eating, and I have a really strong suspicion that if you're honest, I'm not the only one that's ever done that. And here's our body, and we're my, numbing our minds with watching TV. And I'm not against TV, I have one. We're watching TV, and we're filling ourselves with unnecessary calories 
and we're waking up the next day going, I don't know why I don't feel good. Or I'm just big boned. Or my metabolism is really, really slow. Listen, the, the, the fastest metabolism in the world, said, they, they say, is that of a hummingbird. A hummingbird can't burn food fast enough at the rate that we're eating it. I, I'm a big, I, I, obviously, I love strength stuff. And, and I love, like, world's strongest man type stuff. Debbie and Brian, the world's strongest man in recent history is a guy named Brian Shaw, though he didn't win it this last year. But his wife and Debbie, they're like friends on Instagram. And, and Brian Shaw, this guy, will eat about 12,000 calories a day during the off-season and 25,000 calories a day during the, the season. And I've watched how much food that dude has to eat to be 450 pounds and athletic and recover. And there's a lot of reasons why he does what he does. And I'm like, oh, my word. Here's this dude, 6'8", 450 pounds, quite athletic, world's strongest man, able to do a lot of different feats of strength. And he's eating twelve to 20,000 calories a day. And it's like, holy cow, how does he do that? But, I mean, I mean he's lifting 1,000 pounds regularly, does all kinds of major workouts. And then I began to think of the people that I know that are 450, 500, 600, 700 pounds that never work out and how much food they have to eat. And I go to their house and I just see fast food wrapper after fast food wrapper and, and soda after soda. And they're just consuming copious amounts of garbage food. And their excuse is that their metabolism is slow. I just think that's not honest. Now, I know that nobody here is like that, but there is a point to consider when it comes to physical exercise. For many people, they believe if all they would do is add an extra hour or two at the gym every week, all of their problems will be solved. Can I say this? There is no simple solution, but it will take time. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes just kind of given some helpful thoughts about exercise. Listen, I, I'm 47 years old. I have a 24-year-old daughter and a 21-year-old daughter, and eventually they'll get married. Lord willing. I, I just assume that eventually they will. That's the way it is for most folks. And I'm going to have grandkids one of these days. And I want to live my life to be able to play with my grandkids and I want to be 70 years old. I want to retire from ministry right around 70. And then Debbie and I want to travel the world and help missionaries here in the U.S. and all over the world. We want to live our life helping people. I want to be physically fit enough in my life that I can serve the Lord literally until the day that I die and not have people, you know, listen to me or, or let me preach out of pity, but because I am feeding them in truth the Word of God. So, Chris, what are you going to do? What should we do? Well, not everybody here is going to be able to do CrossFit. I love to do CrossFit. It's a big thing that our church does. It's a style of workout that's basically high intensity, constantly fit, varied, and fully functional. That's what we do. You might not be able to do what I do, and that's totally cool. Who cares? But you can be walk fit. You can walk four or five miles a day. You say, well, I couldn't walk four or five miles a day right now. Okay, then start where you can start. But get started. Determine. And there's going to be a lot of reasons that I'll talk about in just a second. But determine in your heart right now, I'm just going to do better. And a year from now, I'm going to be in way better shape than I am today. And you don't have to be the world's most fit person. Nobody's asking you to do that. But be in the best shape you can possibly be one year from now. It doesn't mean you have to be great. You don't have to be in the top 5% of the world's population of shape. I love to work out. I work out all the time. My wife has some major back problems. She works out. She never really lives heavy. I always try to lift heavy. And you know what? I'm as happy with her doing what she can do with the limitations that she has because of her back as I am with somebody else who is super strong and can lift 10 times as much as she can. It doesn't bother me. It shouldn't bother you. You have the body that you have, but determine to be a good steward of the body that you have. So you say, well... What can I do? There's a couple of things that I think you can do. Number one, do something. 
Just do something. You say, well, I, I can't afford to go to a gym. Then do 50 push-ups a day. You say, well, I could never do 50 push-ups in a day. Well, if you can't do 50 push-ups in a day, start on your knees. You say, I couldn't do them on my knees. Then do them against a counter and just do push-ups against a counter and, and do them that way. And if you can't do 50 in a row, which probably you can't, uh, do 10 in a row. So I couldn't do 10 in a row. Fine. Do 10 sets of five. That's going to equal 50. Well, I couldn't do that. Then do 50 sets of one. Just get started. Just get started. Do something. It's the body God has given you. Well, it only profits little. Yes, but it profits. It's extremely profitable. It's a testimony to a lost and dying world. It's an opportunity to reach people with, for Christ. But just do something. Do air squats. Just stand up and bend as low as you can and stand back up. Well, how many times should I do that? As many times as you can. You say, well, I can only do three before I pass out. Then do three, almost pass out, wait five minutes and do it again. I promise you, you will not pass out. And if you do pass it out from working out, it's kind of cool. <laughs> this really is. It really is. I've never done it, but I've heard. Do sit-ups in our office, in my office, uh, pretty much off and on throughout the year, depending on my schedule. I will often do, uh, I'll just take every, every hour, at the top of every hour, I'll do 10 or 20 push-ups. Or if I want to focus on my legs for a while because maybe i got a big squat day coming up or something, I'm going to do 10 or 20 air squats. If uh, my back is hurting, 70% of back problems are caused by a weak core. Did you hear me? 70% of back problems. There, there are some things that aren't like degenerative disc and things like that, but they can often be compensated for with a much stronger core. And so I'll do sit-ups, do 10, 20 every hour. On your lunch break, go for a brisk walk. Go for a workout. If you're a stay-at-home mom, take your kids for a walk every day. And, and walk. Don't meander. And you say, well, how do I get my kids to walk? Have the neighbor's dog chase them. They'll go. It'll be fine. Make it fun. When they're not napping, have them join in you, with you in physical activity. Squats, push-ups. Get a video at the library from some woman in the 80s in a, you know, with leg warmers on. I don't care. Just get moving. I feel like the Baptist Richard Simmons right now. Sweating to the oldies. It's, uh, if you homeschool, make PE a regular part of life. Make physical activity a regular part of, I rem of life. I remember my mother when I was a kid. My mom is a German woman. Anybody else? Be, were you raised by any German parents in here? Anybody else? There's one. Okay. So pray for us. There's like two or three of us. We have serious problems. Our moms were crazy. But my crazy mom, her name's Arlene, she's, she's a wonderful lady. She loves the Lord. Pray for her. She gets out of prison next month. And uh, no, she's a wonderful lady, loves the Lord, seriously. Uh, but my mom, if we started irritating her, this is what my mom said, go outside. Well, what, what do you want to say? This is not, and I was raised in Washington State when I was a little kid. Mom, it's raining outside. She's like, I don't care. Go outside. She viewed me going outside a better alternative than death for me. And so go outside. Well, when can I come back in? When I call you. And you better get on your bike and you better ride all over town and you cannot come back for like three or four or 34 hours, whatever, whenever I call you. And that lady would send us outside and being physically active was a regular part of our childhood for me, my brother and my sister. And it's carried over into our life. Play catch, play tag, go for a bike ride, walk the dog, dig a ditch in your backyard. I remember my dad going, hey, just dig a ditch. Like, okay, dug a ditch. What do you want to do with it? I don't know. Fill it back in. All right. I tried to push my brother in it, but he was five years older than me. That didn't work out well. If you're older, just do something. Lift light weights, even if it's a bottle of water. You can work up to five gallons of water eventually. Or if it's one pound cans of corn or something. Get some PVC pipe, three-quarter inch PVC pipe, and put it over your head, and put it over your head, and put it over your head, and put it over your head a hundred times. And you're like, oh, that won't matter. Okay, do it and call me. I promise you, you're going to feel it. You say, well, how long before I can add weight to that? It won't be too long, but you'll begin to realize that, that, that your body can do a lot more than you think your body can do. I, I work out. 
our, our staff and I, we work out uh, at a CrossFit gym. And we have these people from England that work out. And they are such an inspiration to me. Because when the lady came, she weighed well over 400 pounds. Well over 400 pounds. And she's probably, I don't know if you know him, she's probably about 5'3". And she, she weighed, I mean, I've never asked her to get on the scale, but you can tell she was a very, very heavy woman. And she told me not too long ago before COVID, she said, yeah, I've lost 100 pounds in a year being at this gym. She's, she's still rather large, but man, I'm so encouraged by the journey of physical fitness that she's on. She said, I'll, and her husband said, said, you know, in his accent, I'll, we'll never look like, like you and these people here. I said, man, who cares if you look like us? You're making major changes in your life. You say, pastor, does it matter? Well, is it going to matter when you're 65 or 70 years old and you're stuck sitting on your couch and you can't go on outreach and you can't share the gospel and you can't come to church and you can't play with your grandkids and you, and you can't get out in public because your health is in such bad condition because you overate and were sedentary? I think then it's going to matter. And I think there's going to be a life of regret. You say, well, I know people who've worked out and they've got injured. I do too. I'm one of them. I'll injure myself this week. I don't know how, but it'll happen. I, of course, I'm going to get injured. But I know people who are dying sitting on their couch. And I'd rather get an injury and have to get a massage and Debbie have to stand on my back and then some of the heavier staff members at our church have to stand on my back and then they have to drive a car over my back. I, I would rather have that happen than sit on my couch and waste my life away because I refused to be active. I truly believe it is a point, a total point of stewardship of our life. So I've got a couple more things to help you out with. Why should I exercise? Number one, exercise controls weight. Exercise prevents excess weight. It helps to maintain weight loss. When you engage in physical activity, you burn calories. Now, I want to say this. I think it would be way more fun. And I, God is perfect in every single way. But in my mind, it would be way more fun if every time you burned a calorie, it screamed. When you burned a calorie, it's like in the middle of the workout, you just hear screaming going on the whole time. Like, oh, man, we're doing something. The unfortunate reality is you don't really know. But exercise, we know without a doubt, burns calories. The more intense the activity, the more calories you burn. You don't need to set aside a large chunk of time to exercise to reap weight loss benefits. You can, you, if you can't do an actual workout, get more activity in simple ways. Take the stairs instead of the elevator. Just take the stairs instead of the elevator. Time your household chores. Did you hear what I said? Put it on a clock, like I'm going to vacuum the house. You can do vacuuming. Now, this doesn't work for kids because they'll do a terrible job. But for parents, housewives, or husbands, either any of us, Time it. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vacuum the whole house in seven minutes. And tomorrow I'm going to do it in six minutes and 30 seconds. And your iRobot vacuumer doesn't count. Like, I'm just going to turn that thing on. Walk to work. Walk to work. You say, oh, I live too far. Okay. Walk halfway to work. Park your car at somebody else's house. I don't know. I, our church is three and a half miles from my house, and I felt like my, my low-level level aerobic capacity was not what it needed to be in some workouts. So I started walking back and forth to the office. But then I thought, oh, this is too easy. I can't jog. I broke my ankle. I don't have any cartilage in my left knee. I mean, I can, but it's super painful, and it doesn't benefit me in the long run. It, it, causes, I, I, it puts me out of commission for a while. But walking, I don't have any problem with. And so I, I think I'm going to start walking. So I started walking, counting my time. And I got my time down to where I wanted it to be. And I thought, i got to make this harder. So for my birthday, my daughter Natalie, some of you know her, Natalie bought me a weight vest. And so now I walk with a weight vest on just to make it a little bit harder. You say, why do you do that? I just want to keep challenging my body to do some things. I just want to keep my body literally under subjection. And just keep moving and moving and moving. You say, well, I wouldn't want to do that. Okay, but figure out something. Use some dumbbells. Buy some kettlebells. You say, what are kettlebells? Look it up. They're like a bell with a handle. And you lift them up over your head many, many times. And you'll feel it after a while. And the heavier they are, the quicker you'll feel, you will feel it. Number two, why should you exercise? Because it combats 
health conditions and disease. If you're worried about heart disease, which I am, exercise. It prevents high blood pressure. No matter your current weight, be active. Activity boosts high de density lipid proteins or HDLs or good cholesterol and it decreases uh, triglycerides or the bad cholesterol. Res regular physical activity can help you to prevent or manage a wide range of health problems, including strokes, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, depression. I told this morning about the story that 11 years ago I went through a major depression. I thought I'd never get out of it. I started to do some research on it. I went through it for about a year, year and a half, and started to do some research on it and found that aggressive weightlifting for one session a week is more effective than 10, according to Harvard's Medical School and Research Center, is more effective than 10 trips to a licensed counselor. One aggressive weightlifting session more effective than 10 30-minute sessions at, at a licensed counselor or more, more effective than 300 minutes of, of counseling. I thought, man, I could lift weights. And you know what? I found that to be true. I found that the, the, just the, the, the physical release, the pleasure, the, the endorphin release of aggressive weightlifting is, is over the top. The, the endorphin release of a three-mile walk from home as fast as I can, and that doesn't mean it's very fast, but it's to the, the, the peak of my potential in the moment, is tremendously beneficial in combating depression. You know, I'm saying I'm so depressed I can't move. No, no, that's the worst thing you could ever do. You have to force yourself to get up and move. So I don't think I could do it, Pastor. No, I guarantee you, you can. God's given you the ability. And it might not be as much as you'll be able to do next month or next year, but it's what you can do today. And get up and go for a walk and get up and do a workout. Get up and, and do something. It helps with depression. It helps with certain types of cancer, arthritis. It prevents falling. I mean, exercise just simply combats health conditions and diseases that are destructive, brought about by our weaknesses. Number three, exercise improves mood. How many of you have ever been ticked off? How many of you have never been ticked off at somebody? Ticked off means you're really, really angry, and if you weren't a Christian, you'd run over them. You ever been ticked? <laughs> yeah, I'm there. Ticked off. We're in tick we've been ticked off. We've been upset. We need to blow off some steam. A workout at the gym or a brisk 30-minute walk, it, it helps immensely. You feel better. You feel better about your appearance. It, 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 it improves your mood. I am trying at this point in my life, because now I'm more in control of my schedule, I've taken more control than I ever have before, to never have a potentially difficult meeting without first working out. Why? Because after you work out, you know what? You don't care about a lot of things. Just a lot of little issues aren't that big anymore. It's like, oh, I just worked out. I, that, yeah, that doesn't matter. And you know what? In truth, I think you process things much better because we, I don't know about you, but I'm going to assume that you're not dissimilar from me. We fret over the silliest of things, don't we? We stress out about nonsense. Like, oh, my word, my car got a scratch. What am I going to do? Go work out, come back. You'll key your own car. You don't even care. It just improves your mood. Exercise improves your mood. There's a reason that, that Paul is admonishing exercise, but reminding Timothy that it's only temporarily beneficial. Remember that the, the, the people of Ephesus, the Ephesian people, were a very physically fit people, and they worshiped their body. And Paul is admonishing Timothy, Timothy, don't worship the body, the, the health, that, that exercise is to the body is very, very temporary, but it is helpful. It is helpful. Exercise boosts energy. Exercise boosts energy. Res regular physical activity improves your muscle strength. It boosts your endurance. Exercise and physical activity deliver oxygen and nutrients to your tissues. They help your cardiovascular system. They rid your, it rids your body of toxins. When your heart and lungs get more efficient, you have more energy to go about your daily chores. <laughs> I was, I did some writing for my alma mater on this subject of exercise. They asked me to, and so I, I did. And I talked to a friend of mine who was uh, in, a spiritual leader, and uh, 
he said, hey, I read your articles on exercise. I said, great. What did you think about it? He goes, I agreed with every word. I said, great. And I knew he wasn't physically fit and, and active. I said, are you going to do anything? He said, no, nope, I'm not going to do a thing about it. He said, I like pie, and I like Dr. Pepper, and I just like sitting around. He goes, my activity is hunting, and there's a season for that. And other than that, I'm not really going to do anything. I was like, okay, right on. Four months later, he had a heart attack. Not exaggerating. Four months later, he had a heart attack. You say, well, he would have had a heart attack anyway. I don't know. Would he? Can you guarantee that? Maybe he would have. I don't know. Maybe he wouldn't have. But physical activity, it boosts energy. It, it helps. It makes our heart and lungs much more efficient. It, it Exercise promotes better sleep. I am a terrible sleeper. Anybody else a bad sleeper? Like, I'm just a bad sleeper. I'm not even a sleep worrier. I just, I just wake up. Like, I'm a, I'm, I'm a temperature diva. I said that this morning. Like, if it gets too warm in the room, I'm going to wake up. If it gets too light in the room, my in-laws, they put me in this room while I'm staying there all the time. For 10 years, this has been happening, where the sun comes up right into the window that I'm staying in, and they don't have, like, blackout curtains or anything in there. And so the sun comes up, and it's like you're on a tanning bed, and you just like, oh, you wake up. And as soon as I wake up, I can't go back to sleep. I'm like, oh, my word. And I feel like the sun comes up in Bakersfield at 3 a.m. right now. And so it just comes up. But exercise gives way better sleep. If you don't think so, come work out with me tomorrow. You'll want to go to sleep right away. There have been more than a few times that after a workout, I've walked back into the office. Hey, guys, I'm going to have a quiet time for a while. A <laughs> quiet time is code word for a nap. And it promotes better sleep. Exercise encourages overall good health. See, if you have to exercise, you're going to want to eat well. If, you, if you're going to exercise, if you're going to put out tomorrow, if you're going to just, just, just work really, really hard in the gym tomorrow, you're probably not going to eat three extra pieces of pie tonight because you know what it's going to do to your body tomorrow. If you're going to go for a three-mile walk tomorrow, you're just going to be thinking, I don't want to really push myself eating-wise tonight. Why? Because you know how it's going to make you feel during the workout. I mean, that's just how it is. And so it promotes overall good health, good mood, good sleep, good attitude. And it keeps your body in tune to serve Christ. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. For I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. I told your pastor I have a book coming out in the next month on why Christians should not drink alcohol. Should not drink alcohol. And I've been in a lot of discussions with folks and dialogue with people. And the constant refrain is, you say we can't drink alcohol, but I know fat pastors. And I respond with, well, I don't think that's okay. Well, how can they preach against alcohol if they're gluttons? I said, well, that's, there, there's some argument problems there. It's a red herring. One being bad does not mean that one now erases it or it becomes good. And so we talk about that. But they, there is a point to be made when it comes to my body is supposed to be the temple of God and I'm supposed to keep my body in subjection. And one of the ways that I'm going to have to do that is through physical activity is through and through exercise. Paul said, I buffet myself or I beat myself daily. Now, I know he wasn't talking about exercise, but there is a principle that comfort is not what God has called us to. I, I don't know how many folks in here, but I, the Lord has afforded Debbie and I some cool opportunities to take mission trips around the world. And uh, I've been to Europe and Eastern Europe, and I love Eastern Europe. I, I love Eastern Europe because it's a really big place for Olympic weightlifting. And I, I love Olympic lifting, and so it's really cool to be a part of that. And, and that's really fun to see. And, and then to preach to those folks, it's just so great. And go to some of the villages and preach. I just, I just love it. And held a family conference there and some other stuff. I, just, I, I love Romania and Hungary and Serbia and, and really enjoy it. So I've been to Eastern Europe. I've been to Fiji. I love the nation of Fiji. You've got some great missionaries in Fiji. I hope you're keeping all your missionaries in prayer during the COVID virus pandemic issues because they're really, really struggling, and many of their people are really, really struggling. Please keep them in your prayer. I've had the opportunity to go several times to Asia, and, and one of my favorite countries in all the world outside of America is Cambodia. 
Now, I, I just want to be honest with you. If you go to Cambodia, it's not a comfortable place. There's nothing comfortable about it. Two years ago, 2018, we took 21 people from our church, Debbie and I did, and we took them to Phnom Penh, Cambodia, to be with our, our, our dear friends, the boards, and some, some folks there. We, su we support seven missionaries through a team in Phnom Penh that really go throughout the whole country. And I told them, I said, now listen, guys, you got to understand something. It's going to rain in Phnom Penh every day, and there's going to be water that runs through the streets. Be very, very careful with that water, and if you get wet from that water, as soon as we get back to the motel, you need to take a shower. And they're like, what? Why? I said, because it's not really like water, it's the sewer. Because the pipes in Cambodia, the biggest pipe in the whole city of Phnom Penh is 12 inches. Most of the sewage pipes in Cambodia are probably the size that you have on your property, four to six inches, that run out to the main sewer. And the main sewer in Bakersfield is probably 36 or 48 inches wide, if not bigger. Well, Phnom Penh is five times uh, larger in size, three or four or five times larger in size than the city of Bakersfield. There's a million and a half people in Phnom Penh proper, plus outlying areas. So it's, it's a huge city. And so we're there. We land at the airport on a Tuesday. We left on a Sunday night. We land there because the international dateline on a Tuesday. They pick us up. We haven't slept faster. We haven't slept. You know how it is, international flights. Like you get a cat nap here and there. And, and uh, we, we got a little bit of that. We come into Cambodia. We land in Phnom Penh. They pick us up in a bus. Uh, a rented bus it was really weird and eclectic bus, but they pick us up and they take us to a restaurant to eat. And we're in the restaurant eating. And while we're in a torrential storm happens and the missionary has just reminded them that the water in the streets is the sewage and they need to shower if it happens and to try to avoid any sewage that you can because staph infections are rampant. And it was a few years ago, the number one city in the world for HIV AIDS and just went through all of the reasons why. And while he's telling us it is raining like crazy outside, we get outside and the streets, which aren't well made with, you know, there's two lanes to the street and they're three to four inches in, in water just running down the street. And you can't get to the bus without walking through the street. And we had girls, I had girls looking at me going, Pastor, how am I going to get on the bus? Uh, you're going to walk across the water and get in? Well, Pastor, will you, will you pick me up? You're strong. Can you pick me up and put me on the bus? I can. I won't. Why? Because that's weird, and I'm not going to do that. And then one girl was like, my daughter was like, Dad, won't you sacrifice for me? I will. I will totally sacrifice. She's like, oh, good. But I'm not carrying you across there. No, absolutely not. Here's the principle I'm trying to make, the story I'm trying to make. You're never going to do anything great for God if you stay in your comfort zone. You're never going to get out of lethargy unless you're willing to be uncomfortable. We have a quote wall in our staff, and the quote wall is all these cool quotes that I think motivate me, and hopefully we should motivate others. They probably don't, but they motivate me every time that I see them. And one of them is we live to be uncomfortable, and another one is we're comfortable being uncomfortable. We're just going to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Well, I'm uncomfortable doing that. Good, go do it. But, but, but I'm uncomfortable doing it. I don't really care if you're uncomfortable or not. Go do it. Well, well, well Pastor, I, I don't think I can do 50 pull-ups. Okay, we'll do it. You can. But go to it. But I'm uncomfortable. I'm good. That's all right. Jesus didn't call us to a life of comfort. He, he didn't, matter of fact, he said this. In the world, big picture of Christian philosophy here, in the uh, in the world, you will have tribulation. You'll have tribulation. What tribulation? You're going to have a difficult time. And then he says, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He says, it, Jesus says this, in me you might have peace. In the world you shall. The word shall means will. It's a guarantee. You will have tribulation. Christians are going, Pastor, what about the election? What's going on? What about all of these things? I, I don't know what's going on, but I will guarantee you this, that in this world we will have tribulation. And Western Christianity has gotten this idea that we're supposed to live an uber-comfortable life 
in every single area, and we're never supposed to be uncomfortable. No, God has called us to a life of following Him, and He does not lead us through a primrose path. He leads us beside the still waters because He is the stiller of the waters. But if you remove the Lord from it, the waters are always tumultuous. The world, like the Sea of Galilee, is always churning, always trying to sink our ship of of the Christian life and of our faith. And it is Christ alone who calms the storm. You say, what does it have to do with exercise? Here's the big idea. It's an overarching philosophy in all of our life that you are called to live a life of discomfort and total trust in Christ alone. Well, I don't want my kids to be a missionary to Cambodia. I don't want them to get sick. Well, dear friend, what if God's called them to Cambodia? I don't, I don't want my kids. I, I, I've had so many church planners tell me, I know God's called me to San Diego, but it's too expensive. Number one, why wouldn't you want to live in San Diego? And number two, what are you living for? You see, the inner man, the inner man is transformed day by day. And we learn so much about the inner man by the outer man. And we learn about ourselves when we determine whether or not we will live a life of comfort or discomfort for the cause of Jesus Christ. My friends, Dave and Debbie Board in Cambodia. And there are thousands of great missionaries all over the world. So they are not alone. They're just very dear to me and my wife and our church family. But Dave and Debbie, if they wanted to, could come back to America and pick up in their corporate jobs and, and live the life of thousands of square foot homes, beautiful cars, and give thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars a year to missions. But they gave up their six-figure, mid-six-figure incomes for the glory of God to go to Cambodia and to see a country changed for the cause of Jesus Christ. And they are comfortable being uncomfortable. And one of the great spiritual lessons of exercise is simply this. I'm going to live my life not from a position of comfort, but from a place of being uncomfortable. And I'm going to allow myself to be put in uncomfortable situations uh, physically. And God will one day put me in an uncomfortable place spiritually. And I'm going to need him. And I need to be used to that. I witnessed Friday morning in a very, very uncomfortable situation, sharing the gospel, extremely uncomfortable. I was so thankful for this lesson that God has taught us about being uncomfortable in every single area of our life. It keeps our body in tune to serve Christ. So I've got six quick things to help us, practical ways to improve your exercise. Number one, start. Write it down. Start exercising. How do I improve ex by way exercising? Start. Just get started. If you, if you don't go to a gym, just get up and down off the ground tomorrow 25 times. Just sit down and stand up 25 times on the ground, not in a chair unless you're old. If you're old, sit up and sit down 25 times in a chair. Do 50 push-ups. Go for a walk 30 minutes. Take a class at your gym. Just get started. Number two, research what works for you. Pastor and I were talking. He is not a runner. Your pastor does not run. You say, how do you know he doesn't run? Look at him. He's not a runner. Look at me. I'm not a runner. I tell our church all the time, I'm 47 years old and I've never lost a race in 40. I've never lost a race in 40 meters. Never lost a race in 40 meters. If you run 50 meters, I'm out. I'm done. I quit running at 40 meters. There's, this body does not need to run more than 40 meters. You say, why? Because anything after that, it should be a car ride or a walk. I'm not doing it. But if it works for you to run, praise God for that. I'm not making fun of it. I'm just saying God didn't call me to be a rabbit. He called me to eat them. Certain body types do certain things better. Number three, get an accountability partner. Get an accountability partner. Who is not your spouse? Who is not your spouse? Debbie and I have the privilege of teaching about marriage on a regular basis, both at home and in other places. And I tell people all the time, your wife can never be your accountability partner and you cannot be hers. You've only been married, what, a week? Don't ever be each other's accountability partner. That's the dumbest idea in human history. 
Make your past your accountability partner. Make me your accountability partner. Find some dude on the street you've never met. Make him your accountability partner, but not each other. I try to, I, I can teach people all over how to lift weights, how to work out. But I try to teach my wife, and there is something that clicks in me, rage that comes loose. I'm like, woman, just lift the weight. And she starts asking me questions that are nonsensical, that if any other person in this room asked them, it wouldn't matter to me a hill of beans. But for her to ask it, it drives me nuts. Come on, you should know better than this. We've talked about this. Stop, just lift. And she said, but, you know, what about the gross domestic product of chili in relationship to the kilo versus pound ratio? Shut up. I, 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 she can't be my accountability partner. I don't mean that I don't love her. I love her enough to be honest. She loves me enough to be honest. Just I'm not going to be your accountability partner. She's not going to be mine. But I have them, and you need to have them too. Get an accountability partner, and don't let it be your spouse. Number four. If you have a sedentary job, that means you sit in a chair, get a stand-up desk. Get a stand-up desk. Every person that works for me has a stand-up desk that they have to use at least half the time. You say, well, those are expensive. Not anymore. You can buy them for about 100 bucks now. Your church should buy two, one for your pastor and one for Hunter, though he doesn't need it yet. But he will need it one of these days. He just got married to a Filipina. And let me tell you, Pansit, Pandasol, and Lumpia will balloon a white dude up like nobody's business. Oh, my word. Chicken adobo, watch the weight grow, man. Yeah, I'm just telling you. Get a stand-up desk. And it's great for your back. It's great for your overall body. You will burn. Listen to this. With just a stand-up desk, just a stand-up desk, if you never did anything else, you'll burn the same number of calories as if you ran three and a half marathons in one year. You'll burn that many calories with just a stand-up desk. You say, it takes some while to get used to standing up the whole time. It does. I do it about half the time. I stand up about half. I sit down about half. But get a stand-up desk. And, and again, our church pays for this stuff. You say, why? Well, I, I, I want to be healthy into my 60s. I want our church staff to be healthy. So it's not even an option. New staff member comes on, he gets a stand-up desk. It's just part of the deal. He, he has to make it like six months through, you know, we have to see if we really like him or not. And then he gets a stand-up desk. We might not like him, and so we don't want to invest in him. And we're not going to send this desk home with him. We're just going to encourage him on his way. I would say this as well. Pay for your pastor and pastoral staff to go to a good gym which means it's not a big box gym, to go to a good gym with a good coach. You say, why should we pay for our pastor to do that? Well, number one, your pastor could probably make a lot more money doing anything else in the world. Tom Rayner says this, that being a pastor of a growing church, and he defines growing in four categories, spiritually, financially, outreach, or numerically. And I think your church is growing in all four of those areas. Absolutely. Praise the Lord. That is not happening. Over 800 churches, or I'm sorry, 3,000 churches this year will shutter their doors. And because of COVID, we believe that number will triple or quadruple, meaning between nine and 12,000 churches in America this year will close their doors. What is going on here is very, very rare. Very rare. And you ought to praise the Lord for it. It's not because you're a pastor. It's because of the Lord. But the Lord uses men to do what the Lord wants done. And so I would I can't encourage your church enough. And your pastor would probably would it's not happy that I'm saying this, and I'm not of any concern. Um, I, I, I don't mean that. I, I'm just trying to be funny. I am concerned. But I would encourage your church. Our church pays for me. It pays for everybody who works on the pastoral staff or is in a position of uh, paid leadership at Canyon Ridge. I, I pay for nine people a month. Uh, over $100 each per month to go to my gym with me. It builds a huge amount of camaraderie, and it's a tremendous outreach tool. Here's the deal about your pastor. He's a, he's a soul winning dude, man. He loves souls, and I love that. Here's the deal about Hunter. Soul winning dude. Lo he loves that. But you know what we don't have as pastors? We don't have day-to-day -day relationships with people that are lost. You guys work with folks, and you hear the dirty jokes, and you see people in their ups and downs. We are always pastor everywhere we go. 
When I go to the gym, if I get there tomorrow, I, I don't know when we're leaving. Debbie's going to try to see her grandmother who's in a retirement community tomorrow. And, and if I get home in time, when I go into the gym, you know who I am? I'm Chris, that church guy. And I hear the dirty jokes, and I hear the bad music, and I hear people cuss. And you're like, Pastor, you want to be around that? No, I don't want to be around that. But I also don't want to forget what God has brought me out of and where I could be. And I want to have a regular relationship with people who are struggling. I've witnessed to more people of every type of, of ethnicity, style of life, belief, because I have a relationship with them at a gym. We have a statement at our church, let your outlet be your outreach. And I, I, I mean, you don't have to do it, but I'm just saying it would be super helpful for your pastor because then he's going to come and he's just going to say things that will encourage your overall fitness and your overall all health. And it will help him fight against and prevent and, and Brother Hunter fight and prevent uh, depression, anxiety, stress. It'll, it'll be the church is tremendously benefited if you will do that. You say, well, I just think they should go out and run. OK, I, I just think you're wrong. And I think the mountain of evidence is on my side. But so I would just encourage you to pray sincerely about it, like tonight, and then tell them, hey, tomorrow, why don't you find a gym? I think that's how it should be. I think that's how good churches work. And so pray, that's just how it is. It doesn't need to be a seven-month process. We're not Southern Baptists. <laughs> um, pay for your pastor and staff to go to a good gym with a good coach, wherever that is. And number six, lift heavy things. Lift heavy things. Heavy to you is relative, but lift them. Lift them. Uh, somebody was saying at lunch today, they said, my first exposure to CrossFit was a parade and a bunch of people were flipping tires going down the street. And I thought, I've done that before. Just lift heavy things. Lift whatever you can, whenever you can, however you can, but lift heavy things. Bodily exercise is temporal, but it is important. It's important. God has not called you to be the fittest on earth, but God has called you to use your strength for him and for the cause of Christ, and for His glory. And as you do, He is glorified, and people will be reached with the gospel of Christ. Tonight, I just want you to think deeply. Normally, I encourage people to come to an altar and pray and do all of that. I don't, I don't, that would be weird for me to do tonight. But I will encourage you to do this. Has the Holy Spirit of God spoken to you about your love of comfort and food as opposed to work and exercise to the glory of God? Let me ask you this question, that question in a different way. Do you not go door knocking because you're afraid you can't make it to the end of the road? Do you not help your neighbor and be the hands and feet of Jesus because you don't think you can lift anything? And I'm not talking about an injury. I'm just talking about you, you have so sedentated your lifestyle. I don't even know if that's a word, but it sounds really good. You're so sedentary now that you, you can't even help anybody. God has called us to live our life for His glory. And it's beautiful when we play music. And it's beautiful when we sing. And it's beautiful when we gather together for worship. And it's amazing when we witness. But can I tell you, God is glorified as well when we say, Lord, this body is not simply mine. It's a gift from You. And I'm going to steward it well so that I can serve You to the best of my ability for the rest of my life. And... Our prayer is tonight that you'll think deeply about that because you're going to learn next week about the inner man. And, and, and Jay, the preacher next week, Jay Denver was saying, oh, dear friend of mine, we were talking earlier this year. He said, Chris, you're going to be so proud of me. I started going to the gym. and I started swimming and lifting weights five days a week. I said, like, right on, right on. Why? Because he knows the relationship between the outer man and the inner man and the interdependency they have on one another. You cannot divorce them from one another. They are interdependent on each other. Not independent. They will not survive without the other. They are interdependent with each other. And our prayer tonight is that you would consider it deeply. Bodily exercise is temporal, but it's beneficial, and it's all for the glory of God. Father, bless our time in the Word. We're thankful for it. You're a good God, an interesting subject matter, no doubt about it. And I pray that you'd help us tonight, Father. A little longer service, but Father, I pray that you would help us this evening to be totally and completely dependent on you, totally and completely submitted to you, reliant on you, 
and that our lives would be transformed by the power of your word. Lord, please. We love you, Christ. We thank you. Thank you for these dear people. Thank you for their great spirit. Thank you for their openness. I feel a sense of great openness, a heart of, of reception tonight. And I pray that you will help us all to live our lives to your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, preacher. And uh, you pray for, for our preacher. That's not an easy topic to cover. And uh, honestly, that's kind of why I had him come and uh, cover it. And uh, what a blessing that is. And it's true. I'm not a runner. I told him at lunch, I said, if you ever see me running, you should run. Because uh, that is the only reason I would run. Um, but uh, thank you for that. And I certainly want to steward my life and my body better than, uh, than I have. And church family, you pray for me. I pray for you. And we've all got things to improve on. And so what a blessing tonight's going to be. And uh, we have removed all chairs. And so you're going to have a standing desk while you eat cake. And uh, so I'm going to ask Brother Chadwick, would you pray for the food tonight and actually ask that God would transubstantiate the cake into salad in our mouths? And uh, actually, before we do that, we do have, we do have the privilege of voting in Miss Esther Greenlee. And uh, sister, uh, we are so uh, thankful to have you. And uh, like I told uh, Brother Hunter, I said it at the wedding, and I don't know if you know this. I know our deacons know this. I told Brother Hunter when he came and he, uh, he worked with us for the summer, I said, all right, brother, I want you to know. I said, if you do not get married, you cannot be my youth pastor. And uh, so you have exactly, you said, pastor, you said that I did. I said, you have nine months to find a wife. And uh, so we began to pray and uh, God blessed and uh, thank God for that. So we knew I was, I just, I knew already. I knew God would do it. And uh, so all in favor of Miss Esther joining our church, say amen. Any opposed? All right, sister, I'll, get, I'll bring this down to you. But Brother Chris, would you pray? And here's what we're going to do. After prayer, we'll dismiss all the congregation out. We'll have our lovely couple come out. I'll announce them as they come out. We've got a cake for them to cut. And, and uh, there's pre-cut cake, and it's covered in everything. And so uh, we'll enjoy that. But would you come and ask God's blessing on the food and the fellowship? And then we'll have everybody dismiss uh, this direction. And then we'll have our couple come out in just a couple minutes. Brother Chris. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for a great night, a great church, great church family. Uh, we're thankful for the fellowship, but Lord, we're thankful for the reason of the fellowship. We pray you would be with Hunter and Esther in their marriage. We pray it would be a shining example of your grace. We pray that their marriage would be a testimony of your goodness to those around them and that through their life and ministry, many hundreds and thousands of people will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, they're going to face trials that they never imagined. It will be revealed to them their need for growth in areas that they never dreamed of. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage them, you would strengthen them, you would help them. Thank you that Esther is joining into this great church family. I pray that they will use the resources that are here in people and the pastor and counselors and friends and encouragers in a great way. And that, Father, you will just do a great uh, work in and through uh, them and her tonight specifically as she joins the church. Bless the food. Uh, and the fellowship help us to just enjoy our time together may we leave this evening encouraged in you in Jesus name amen